Hallelujah. And Lord, that's why we come. That's why we're here as we gather, as the Ohana. Lord, just to sing praises to your name. For you, Lord, alone are worthy. So Lord, enable us to continue to worship you, not just through the songs we sing, but now, Lord, through the study of your word. For truly, Lord, as we come, we don't come to get, but to give, to give praise and worship and adoration unto you. So Lord, how thankful we are for these few short minutes you give us that we can learn of you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen, amen. amen. Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Uh, last time we were together, we looked at chapter 28, a rather lengthy chapter, uh, 68 verses in all, and we saw that it really only involved two things. One, blessing. Two, curses. And the point was simple. God was saying, if you obey me, then I will bless you. But if you do not obey me, then I will curse you. Aren't you glad God made life so simple? It really is pretty easy when you stop and think about it. You want to be blessed? <laughs> yeah, okay, three of you, good, yes. Then obey the Lord. I mean, it's, life can't get any simpler than that. And I think the point for all of us was very, very simple. And that is there is always consequences to our actions, whether they be good or bad. Paul talks about that, Galatians 6, 7. He said, don't be deceived, God's not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. If we sow to the flesh of the flesh, we're going to reap destruction. But if we sow to the spirit of the spirit, we shall reap everlasting life. So clearly the whole point of chapter 28 dealt with consequences to actions. Now, as we come to chapters 29 and 30, we conclude the third sermon by Moses. Most believe it began back in verse or chapter 27. Although there are those who say no, chapters 29 and 30 really involve the fourth sermon of Moses. Either way, the whole point of this section deals with the fact that Moses confirms the covenant of the Lord with the children of Israel. That's what chapters 29 and, 20 and 30 are all about. The fact that Moses confirms the covenant of the Lord with the children of Israel. In fact, look at verse 1 of chapter 29. It says, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant or the agreement which he made with them in Horeb. Now, Horeb is Mount Sinai. You remember the children of Israel were camped at the base of Mount Sinai for about two years where they received God's covenant, his commands, his promises, his oath, his agreement between him and them. Here, while the children of Israel are in the plains of Moab, right across from Jericho on the eastern side of the Jordan, in just a few short weeks, they're going to cross the Jordan and enter the promised land. Moses once again confirms this covenant, this oath, this agreement that God had made with the children of Israel. Now, there are four things we want to look at in our time together today, if you're outlining our text. The first thing involves the commands regarding the word of the Lord the commands regarding the word of the Lord. Uh, that's in verses 2 through 9 here in chapter 29. And when we get to verse 9, we're going to see the actual commands. Uh, but first of all, in verses 2 through 8, we see the, uh, the reason for obeying these commands. Take a look. In verse 2, it says, Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his lands, the great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very 
day. Even though you saw and heard all of the signs and wonders that God performed in Egypt, you witnessed all of the miraculous occurrences, still you don't quite get it. You don't, you don't fully understand all that God has done for you. The point is, at this point, they don't have spiritual understanding. They don't have spiritual eyes to see. In fact, Paul quotes verse four in Romans chapter 11, verse eight, in dealing with the nation of Israel. How God has actually given them this spirit of stupor, eyes that they cannot see, hearts that they cannot understand. The problem is spiritual blindness, spiritual uh, non-understanding. Now, the Jews, the nation of Israel, the children of Israel will one day receive understanding. They will receive spiritual eyes and spiritual ears and spiritual hearts, we might say, but it will come about presumably when the fullness of the Gentiles occur in Romans chapter 11 verses 25 through 27. And the fullness of the Gentiles presumably speaks of that last person that gets saved who's supposed to get saved, which facilitates the rapture of the church when the church is caught up and taken into heaven and everyone else is left behind presumably at that point they then will have the spirit of stupor lifted from their hearts and the scales will drop from their eyes and I think the point for you and I as it pertains to an application for us is very simple and that is any one who does not have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is in the same boat as the children of Israel. There is a lack of spiritual understanding. There's no comprehension to spiritual things. Uh, most of us have probably experienced that in talking with people who aren't saved. Y you start to share with them the most elementary principles of Scripture and their heads starting to turn and their eyes are squinting and they're looking at you like you're from outer space. Like what in the world are you talking about? And the reason is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 where Paul said the natural man does not receive the, spirit, the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them for they are spiritually discerned. But when we give our life to Christ, he gives us his Holy Spirit. And now we have spiritual understanding, something that even young children can understand. Why? Because it's being revealed to them spiritually. Well, this section continues. Look at verse 5. He says, And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. In other words, here's another reason for obeying these commands we're going to see in verse 9. Not only because of the miraculous signs and wonders that God did for them in Egypt in bringing them out, but also for the 40 years in the wilderness. For 40 years, their clothes didn't wear out. They never had to buy new sandals. Now, men, that should bless all of us to no end if that would occur today. <laughs> no more new shoes? Wow. They didn't have to buy new clothes. They didn't have to buy new shoes. They didn't have to plant and harvest any wheat for bread, and they didn't have to plant any vineyards for the, for the vine, for the, for the grape juice, if you will. Why? Because God provided everything they needed for those 40 years. And what was true for the nation of Israel is equally true for us. Clark, are you saying that God has provided everything we need? Oh, yes. In fact, the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, that my God will provide all your need according to his riches and glory. Question, does God give us everything we need? Yes, yes no doubt about it. Now, he doesn't always give us everything we want, but he will always give us everything we need. And I have no idea what I need, 
until I get it. And once I get it, I got it. Because God has given it. Follow me? Now I know I must need this because I have this. And if I don't have it, I obviously don't need it. Again, God has made life very simple for us. You say, well then, why are there so many problems in my life? Well, because most of the problems we face in our life come from a lack of contentment. We're simply not content with where we're at, with who we are, with what we have. We always have that grass is greener on the other side syndrome. Paul understood that in Philippians 4, 11, and 12. He said, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in, whether I'm full or abased, whether I got it all or <laughs> I've got nothing at all. It's a simple truth but an important one for us to really live in light of. I'll tell you, it makes life so much easier when we take that step back and say, okay, Lord, I must not need it because I don't have it. Well, this section continues. Look at verses 7 and 8. A couple more reasons why they should obey these commands regarding the word of the Lord. In verse 7, it says, and when you came to this place, there to the plains of Moab, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, and we conquered them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now, back in Numbers chapter 21, when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, they were coming up what we call the King's Highway. Uh, they were coming up on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. And there, of course, they encountered these two kings that are mentioned here in verse 7, Sihong, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan. They subsequently conquered those kings and took their territories. And in Numbers chapter 32, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh wanted to stay in that area. So Moses said, okay, fine, you guys can stay in this area where the other tribes will cross over into the promised land. And according to verse 9, he says, therefore, as a reason for obeying the words of the Lord, everything that I've told you, therefore keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. So as a direct result of all these glorious truths Moses gives, two commandments. There are two commandments in verse nine regarding the word of the Lord. What are they to do regarding the word of the Lord? Well, according to verse nine, number one, they're to keep it. Keep it. The word in the Hebrew means to guard it to watch over it, to protect it. We might say to treasure it. I think by way of application, for you and for me, it would be to treasure, to keep, to guard God's word in our hearts. In fact, in Psalm 119.11, the psalmist said, your word I have hid in my heart. I'm protecting it, I'm watching over it, I'm keeping it close to me, if you will. Psalm 102, it says, his delight is the law of the Lord, and in it he meditates day and night. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So the first thing there to do regarding this commandment is to keep the word of God. Man, treasure it in your heart, hold it close. Number two, the second command in verse 9 is to do it. <laughs> he says, and do them. It means to simply put it into practice. And I think this is an important point for all of us. Because we can hear the word of the Lord. We can study the word of the Lord. We can even know a lot of things about the word of the Lord. But the question is, are we doing the word of the Lord? Are we actually putting into practice the things we hear on a weekly basis, every Wednesday when we come, every Sunday, Monday, at the, Monday night at the men's ministry, Saturday morning at the men's ministry, Thursday morning for the women's ministry, Thursday night for the women's ministry, Fridays at the home fellowships. 
at all the different groups, all the different gatherings, man, we're really soaking it in. The question is, are we doing it? You know, James talks about this, by the way. You all know the verse, James 1, 22. We're to be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Look, we're de deceiving ourselves if, if we think that we can just simply hear God's word and not do it. Well, back to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Let's come to the second thing we want to look at. We said there were four. Uh, we've looked at the commands regarding the word of the Lord. Now, this second section deals with a caution about turning from the Lord. In verses 10 through 29, we have a caution about turning from the Lord. Uh, look at verse 10 of Deuteronomy 29. It says, all of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath which the Lord your God makes with you today that he may establish you today as a people for himself and that he may be God to you just as he spoke to you and just as he has sworn to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I make this covenant and this oath not with you alone, but also with him who stands here with us today uh, before the Lord our God, as well as him who is not here with us today, speaking of future generations. For you know that we dwelt in the land of Egypt and that we came through the nations which you passed by and you saw their abominations or their detestable practices and their idols which were among them, wood and stone and silver and gold so that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood, literally poison. So here the caution about turning from the Lord involves the heart. It's very clear uh, there in verse 18. The caution about turning away from the Lord starts with the heart because that is God's primary concern. God is concerned, yes, with our actions, please don't misunderstand, but ultimately what he's concerned with is the heart because everything flows from the heart. In fact, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, God doesn't see man the way man sees man. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. In fact, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 verses 27 and on, Jesus said, you've heard it said you shouldn't commit adultery, but I say to you, if you look lustfully on a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Look, it's all about the heart. It's about what's on the inside, not on the outside. Yes, we should always do the right thing, but it needs to come from the right reason. And here's the problem with our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says it's deceitfully wicked. <laughs> it's exceedingly wicked, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, God knows the heart and only God can change the heart. And that's why the power of prayer is so important. Oh, we might be able to change somebody's mind through behavioral modification with the carrot and the stick but only God can change the heart. And once God changes the heart, the actions then follow. And that's why prayer is so important. Look, there's a lot of people that are messed up out there that need to be fixed. <laughs> and we are them. So what's the solution? Well, Jesus, man, 
Only Christ can give us that new heart, that new spirit, and we'll talk more on that in just a moment. Well, this section continues. Look at verse 19. In verse 19 it says, and so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace even though I walk in the imagination of my heart, as though the drunkard could be included with the sober. How ridiculous. The Lord would not spare him, for then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man, and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Man, anyone who turns from the Lord and continues in their sin will in fact be judged. And you're not going to be able to blend in by the way. No more than a drunkard can blend in with those who are sober. It's going to be very obvious, very evident by what we do as it pertains to to this caution from turning against the Lord, turning away from the Lord. And if we do do that, God says there's going to be consequences. There's going to be judgment. And I think for us today, the admonition is very powerful. And that is this, that it is absolute foolishness to think that somehow we can continue in a lifestyle of sin and somehow we're going to get away with it. <laughs> Somehow God's going to overlook it. He's going to wink at it or forget about it. You know, in Numbers 32, 23, Moses told the children of Israel, be sure your sin will find you out. Look, payday one day. Romans 2, 6 says God's going to deed to each man according to what he has done. Well, in verse 21, it, this section continues dealing with this caution about turning from the Lord. It says, and the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book so that the coming generation of your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land would say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord has laid on it, the whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zebuim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. All nations would say, why has the Lord done so to this land? What does the heat of his anger, or of this anger, mean? Then men would say, well, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They turned from the Lord, in other words, for they went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods that they did not know and that he had not given to them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against this land to bring, it, bring on it every curse that is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger, in wrath, and in great indignation, and cast them into another land as it is this day. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. In other words, what he hasn't said is still secret. But those things which are revealed, everything he has said, belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. So this caution about turning from the Lord involves judgment, clearly. But the judgment is not only for the individual, but the judgment will come upon the nation as a whole. And here the judgment, as it mentions in verse 28, is to uproot them from their land, the promised land, and take them to a different land. And of course, that will be realized in just a few short years after they enter the promised land. Because in 722 B.C., the Assyrians came and captured the ten northern tribes called Israel. And then subsequently in 586 B.C., the Babylonians came and captured the two southern tribes called Judah. So in um, 
let's see, six, 14, I don't know, I'd have to get the calculator. 14, 45, in about 700 years, a short period of time, God will remove them from the land. You say, Clark, that's all fine and dandy, but what's the point? The point is there's a caution here from turning away from the Lord. Look, anytime we turn away from the Lord, we're in for a world of trouble. Man, we're off on our own. We're doing our own thing. And we're going to reap the consequences of our actions. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now, let's come to the third thing we want to look at. We said there were four. We've looked at the commands regarding the word of the Lord. We've looked at the caution about turning from the Lord. Now, the third thing involves the coming back to the Lord. In verses 1 through 10 in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses talks about coming back to the Lord. We might say repentance. Uh, look at verse 1 of Deuteronomy 30. It says, Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curses which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. So as they come back to the Lord, as they turn and repent of their sin, God then delivers them out of captivity. Now, clearly, this is a reference looking forward to Babylonian captivity. And when they were released from Babylonian captivity, there were three waves of captives that were released. The first wave was under Zerubbabel in 538 BC. He led the first wave of captives out of Babylon back to Jerusalem. Uh, the second wave came under Ezra. Uh, that was in 458 BC. And then, of course, the third and final wave under Nehemiah in 445 BC. Three waves of captives that were released from Babylon and brought back to the promised land. They were restored. Why? Because they repented. And boy, what a beautiful picture this paints. Look, when we come back to the Lord, when we turn from sin, confess our sin, repent of our sin. God forgives, God forgets. He restores, he rebuilds, he rejuvenates all the years that the locusts have eaten. Yes, there's consequences to our sins, but man, when we get right with God, when we turn back to God, there's restoration, there's healing, there's hope. And you know, no matter where we've been or what we've done, no matter how bad our past may be, man, when we turn back to the Lord, when we come back to Jesus, he begins to rebuild us and restore us. He begins to strengthen our heart and our hands for his service. And you know, it doesn't matter what our past is. God desires to use all of us. He desires for us to come into his service, ministering one to another. And here we see the beautiful promise of restoration and coming back to the Lord. Well, in, verses, in verse 4, this continues. He says, If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under the heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Now, no doubt, verses 4 and 5 look forward, way past the Babylonian captivity, past the church age, past the tribulation, to the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
when Jesus Christ at the end of the seven years of tribulation comes back to the earth. He judges the nations. It begins there in Basra according to Isaiah 63. He moves north up into the valley of decision or the Kidron Valley, Joel chapter 3. And then of course the final battle in the valley of Armageddon or Harmageddo uh, there in Revelation 19 uh, verses 11 through 20. And then he establishes his millennial kingdom, the 1,000 year rule and reign of Christ on the earth. According to Matthew chapter 24 verse 31, this is when Jesus Christ will gather his elect, the nation of Israel, all of the Jews, from the four corners of the earth. And he will gather them and bring them into the promised land, back to Israel. So no doubt verses 4 and 5 looks forward prophetically to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then in verse 6, it says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Also, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you and persecute you and you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand in the fruit of your body in the increase of your livestock and in the produce of your land for good for the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Man, what a beautiful promise coming back to the Lord. When they come back to the Lord, when they repent and turn back to God, he will circumcise their heart. Now, he will then give them a new heart or a new spirit, we might say. It's mentioned in Ezekiel 36, 26. In fact, uh, Paul talks about this whole idea in Romans chapter 2, verses 29 and on. He talks about the circumcision of the heart, how God will cut away the bad, if you will, and give us a new heart. Because as we've mentioned before, that's the problem. The problem is with our heart. So when we come back to the Lord, repent and get right with God, he then gives us a new heart and a new spirit. And it is that new heart, listen gang, it is that new heart and new spirit that enables us and empowers us to have the desire to be obedient to his commandments. To give us that desire to do what God tells us to do. Because the problem we have is our natural tendency, our natural desire is to do just the opposite of what God wants us to do. I mean, that's the flesh. And, and I know in my own life, when I think, okay, this is what I should do, 90% of the time I should do just the opposite. <laughs> Soon as I think of something, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm like, okay, I better do just the opposite because that's probably the right thing to do. And 99% of the time that's correct. Why? Well, because I've got a heart problem. But when we get right with God, when we come to Christ, he gives us that new heart and that new spirit. And now there's a, a new desire to follow the Lord and to obey his commands. Well, number four and finally, and let's wrap this up with this final section. The fourth and final thing is a call to choose life from the Lord. Number four, a call to choose life from the Lord. Look at verses 11 through 20. In verse 11 of Deuteronomy chapter 30, it says, for this commandment which I command you today it is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. 
It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that you may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us to bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Look, this is not a mysterious thing. It's not far off that we can't understand it, that we can't get it. It's pretty simple. God has given us a choice. We can choose life and good or choose death and evil. Now, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the pack. Amen, okay. But even I get this. <laughs> I totally understand this. And I'm so glad God has made his word so simple. It's not mysterious. It's not far off. It's not way out in heaven. It's not across the sea. Man, it's right here in our own heart, in our own mouth. The decision is ours. Choose life or choose death. Well, it goes on. Look at verse 16. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments. Why? That you may live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But, but, if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish you shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Man, as a result of answering the call to choose life, we receive that new heart, that new spirit, that enables us, listen, and empowers us to be able to choose life that we might live. In fact, I love it in verse 20, after we have chosen life, the reason is so that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him. You get the correlation? Once we change our mind, God changes our heart. Once we change our mind and we in and of ourself choose life, God then changes our heart. He gives us a new heart, a new spirit. Ezekiel 36, 26. And now, note carefully class, we have the capacity, the resources, the enablement, the empowerment so that we can love the Lord our God, so that we can be obedient to him. Now it is not a work of the flesh, it's a work of the spirit. No wonder we're told in Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And this is what God wants to do for each and every one of us as believers to enable us through his spirit to do what he's called us to do. Look, if we try to obey the commandments of God in our own strength, in our own effort, in the power of our flesh, we'll always fail miserably. But praise be to God, he has given us the resources we need to do what he's called us to do. And I gotta tell you, that blesses the socks off my stinky little feet to be sure. Father, how thankful we are for your empowerment, your enablement, person and the presence of your Holy Spirit that helps us, Lord, to do all that you've called us to do. 
And Lord, how thankful we are for your word. Lord, it's so rich, so good, so practical, Lord. And Lord, we're just so overwhelmed by your faithfulness, by your goodness, by your love for us, by the Holy Spirit you've given to us, the new heart you've placed in us, enabling us to walk in the Spirit, to be led by your Spirit giving us that desire to do what you've called us to do. And Lord, we realize apart from you, we can do nothing. But in, through, and because of you, Lord, we can do all things. So we thank you for that. Pray we would never forget that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for any reason at all, after service, the pastors, brothers and sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, and just to minister to whatever need there may be in your lives today. And I do pray that God would continue to fill you with his spirit, encourage you and empower you. Man, just to use you in a very real and practical way as you walk in his truths. God bless you guys. I love you much. Have a, a great rest of the week in the Lord.